Good morning. You can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Dean Martha Minow, and it is just an enormous delight for me to welcome you all here for this very special occasion. Harvard Law School is honored, deans get to say things like that, to use our convening power and our space to provide a national platform for engaged discussion on pressing issues of our time. We are so honored to have this occasion, because I can't imagine anyone in this country who has a more pressing portfolio. Three years ago, we held an all-day conference marking the 40th anniversary of the Environmental Protection Agency's creation. And I'll never forget the quiet moment when Vice President Al Gore turned to Administrator Lisa Jackson and said, you're about to face the toughest hammering, but the next generations are counting on you. We are thrilled to welcome Administrator McCarthy as she returns to her hometown of Boston. <laughs> Woo! Well, is it Boston or Brighton? Uh, Boston, okay, to celebrate the start of her tenure as Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. And we especially welcome her friends and colleagues of many years. The New York Times describes Administrator McCarthy as, and I quote, an earthy, tough-talking New Englander who has helped to write controversial regulations. I would like to point out, none of that scares us. <laughs> These halls are devoted to tough talk about controversial issues, and the administrator honors us by choosing this venue for her first public address in her new role. She finds a congenial setting as Harvard Law School shares the EPA's devotion to addressing simultaneously environmental and energy issues. Indeed, when our colleague Professor Jody Freeman returned from her service at, as White House Counselor for Energy and Climate Change, she stressed that our environmental work must address constructive solutions to simultaneously deal with the pressing issues of environmental quality and energy production and use. Jody has worked nonstop to build our world-class Emmett Environmental Law Policy uh, Clinic, and I know that she is so sorry that her travels in Africa mean today that she misses the chance to be here with her friend, the administrator. They work closely together to broker the historic fuel economy standards slashing carbon emissions from our transportation sector. We're joined today by our colleague, Professor Richard Lazarus, extraordinary environmental law scholar and Supreme Court advocate. So sorry that he's actually going to be uh, in demand for doing just that kind of work in the coming days ahead. We're so lucky we were able to convince him to come here shortly after he served as the executive director of the president's 2010 Gulf Oil Spill Commission. And he will uh, preside over the questions and answers following the administrator's address. Another anchor here is Wendy Jacobs, uh, who has built a, the fabulous Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, engaging students in the practical problem solving uh, that the world needs more than ever. Students take on projects for local, state, and national clients. For example, Wendy, with Sean Goho, the clinic staff attorney, uh, worked with students to help draft a wetland policy and a procurement policy for the city of Boston as part of the city's climate adaptation efforts. Students have also convinced the courts to uh, open up avenues for in the, who installs clean technology. They've researched municipal rights to regulate hydraulic fracking, and they published a guidebook to uh, direct landowners entering into leases with unconventional oil and gas companies. We will be hiring another staff attorney this year, and uh, we'll be looking to all of you for problems that we can help address. This year, the Environmental Law and Policy uh, Program launched a policy initiative, which is directed by Kate Konchnik, who we were lucky enough to convince to come here from the Hill. The policy initiative has already grown uh, into the national environmental and energy debates, and her writing on state fracking and chemical disclosure laws, for in instance, has received national attention. The students, though, are the core of our program. And the, most of them are not here in person, but they're watching, I know, because we are live streaming this event. Their engagement uh, in the clinic and other components of the environmental law program and partnerships with other parts of, of Harvard and this community uh, stretch into the business uh, world, including the business school's uh, efforts on innovation in, in business, energy, and environment. 
And they also run our Environmental Law Journal, our Environmental Law Society, and uh, our Environmental Law Society will be hosting the 2014 National Environmental Law Society Conference. Um, and uh, they will be hosting a conference on environmental justice issues, which increasingly are so central uh, as the biggest burdens from environmental degradation affect the most disadvantaged populations. And this will occur on the 20th anniversary of President Clinton's Environmental Justice Executive Order. This building is also an appropriate one to host this event. It's only uh, about a year and a half old, and it speaks volumes about the students' interest in the environment as well as the university and the law school's commitment to producing a healthier, more sustainable world. This is a LEED Gold certified building, and we'll be paying for it for about 30 years. <laughs> we are housed in a university that takes sustainable efforts very seriously. Harvard has an ambitious plan to reduce its greenhouse gases uh, so that the emissions uh, reduce by 2016 following a 2006 baseline by 30%. We're more than halfway there. Um, it's hard. This is hard work. Um, but we're getting there, and we hope uh, that we can continue to lead in this and other uh, domains. And our research programs across the campus are finding innovative ways to meet the energy and environmental challenges, uh, working with uh, many partners in the Boston area, where Boston is a hub of energy innovation, environmental problem solving, represented by the cross-section of experts who are here today. And we thank you so much for your participation and for helping us to welcome the administrator to campus. To introduce the administrator, we looked for an expert. And it's my privilege to introduce to you Maggie McCary, who's a program coordinator at the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, working on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable programs across state governmental operations. She also has been a fellow with the Energy Department and conducted water quality research with the State Department of Environmental Protection. We are eager to involve her more than on this day, and I know that she is joined by her siblings, uh, who will cheer as she introduces her mother. So please, uh, will join me in welcoming Maggie. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Dean Minow for the introduction. It's amazing to hear all of the great things that Harvard Law School is doing. And I smiled as I walked in and saw the LEED certification on the wall. Um, so good morning to everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, this morning, I am here with the distinct privilege of introducing President Obama's newly confirmed EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy. But even cooler than that, I'm here to introduce my mom. I thought it would be fun, and now I know slightly nerve-wracking, to stand up here and introduce her. I can tell you, though, some things that you might not know about your EPA administrator. <laughs> like the fact that she has three children, all within about a three-year age range of each other. So as you can imagine, over the last 20-something years, she's really perfected her mediating skills. She's brought together different opinions and solved arguments with logical solutions. These are important arguments, like, Julie is wearing my clothes without asking again. Or mom, why does Dan get to stay up late and watch TV, but I have to go to bed? Or did you know that your new EPA administrator is a huge fan of any and all cooking shows on TV? <laughs> a habit our family has become very fond of. Watching her cook in the kitchen is an experience of its own. And when she is done, we talk about our meals for weeks, usually until we convince her to come back to Boston to cook us another. It shows you just how much dedica dedication and passion she has for everything she does, whether it be her family, her cooking, her dogs, her work, or even her Boston sports teams. Go Sox. <laughs> so why am I here telling you this today? I am telling you this because I can vouch for this woman. The things you've heard and read are true. The qualities that I admire and respect in her personal life, those same qualities that I know she'll bring to her critical role as EPA administrator. Her straightforward to the point communication. Her ability to see all sides of an issue, respect people's opinions, and make sound decisions. Her confidence and sense of humor to help mediate and work through tough issues. Her ability to lead, to motivate, and to instill confidence to help people work to their full potential. Someone who has morals and someone who sticks to them. She's all that and much more. 
As a young professional in the clean energy field here in Massachusetts, and the daughter of such an established and well-respected woman, many people may think I'm crazy to follow her footsteps. How will I ever live up to her legacy? But for me, the real question is why would I not want to be like her? I know I speak for both of my siblings when I say that we are lucky to have a role model who has always been supportive while pushing us to our potential and instilling in a very important trait in all of us, the desire to help people, to give back, and to work to make this world a better place. This is why I am proud, I'm confident, and I am very excited to share my role model with the nation during this very critical time. With that, I am very honored to introduce to you, President Barack Obama's new EPA administrator and my mom, Ms. Gina McCarthy. That is just so not fair. <laughs> not make me follow that, and you, I am a, inside a blubbering idiot. But I'm a very proud mother. Um, thank you, Maggie, for the kind words. I can't tell you how incredibly cool it is to be back home uh, in Boston for my sp first speech as EPA administrator, and to have you here and to remind all of us why we do the work that we do. Uh, it's really all about our children. It's really all about our future generations. So I want to thank you and Julie and Dan, who should be hot at work at Children's right now, uh, for helping to make this generation a whole lot smarter than the one that I, that I grew up in, uh, one that is really helping to chart a course to a brighter future. And I think it's our goal to make sure that we get the heck out of the way um, and let them do what we know they, they will do, uh, which is really ensure that we have a sustainable economy and a protected environment. Um, so I'm so excited. I am so proud. I think I should stop now because I cannot beat her speech. <laughs> But I won't. I won't stop now. Um, I, I, first of all, uh, I want to thank Dean Minow uh, and thank you and thank Professor Lazarus and your whole team for all of the great work you do and for bringing us to this lovely location. Um, I am so thankful that you agreed to host today. Um, it's, a, it's a great crowd and, and as I look out, it's, it's amazing to take a look at some of the faces of the people that have uh, inspired me um, and that have allowed me to work for them. Uh, that have pushed me to, to my greatest potential, um, that allowed me to work hand in hand with them to do some uh, amazing things. And this has been a just an incredible journey. Um, so I want to thank all of you for sharing it with me. I want to thank all of you who gave me a, a break um, and allowed me to grow as a person, as a manager, um, as a public servant, and as a human being. Um, you have taught me some wonderful lessons, and, and frankly, the lessons that I think about every night uh, when I go to sleep and I wonder what I'm going to be doing the next day. Um, it has been an engaging journey, and one at EPA that I feel in many ways I'm just beginning. So I'm so thankful to all of you. You know, uh, getting it confirmed two weeks ago, um, it was truly an honor of a lifetime. Um, and that's, a, I think, a very good thing because I swear it took two lifetimes for me <laughs> to get confirmed. Um, okay, it's a slight exaggeration, slight exaggeration, but it was a thousand plus questions, 70 plus uh, Senate visits, 147 days later, and here I am. That was easy. <laughs> And I want to uh, begin by uh, taking just, just a minute um, before I do anything else uh, to give my biggest shout out and a thank you to President Obama um, for his willingness and his courage to nominate and stand by me. Um, I clearly knew, as did he, uh, that this was not going to be easy. Um, as many of you may be very surprised to hear, I was not a wallflower at EPA. 
uh, I actually was involved in some many difficult decisions. Uh, but the president not only uh, supported me every step of the way, he also sent a signal to the great people at EPA. Um, he sent a signal to all of them who work so hard every day and are so good at what they do that their mission matters, that it's important to protect public health and the environment, that it was going to be a tenant of what he did and part of his legacy that he would leave behind. I think he has overseen in his first term some of the most productive years in our agency's history. In my ear world, we took some common sense steps to reduce mercury pollution and other ha harmful toxics from the air. We established new health standards, new health standards for sulfur dioxide, soot, particle pollution. We started regulating greenhouse gases that may have had something to do with the Massachusetts VEPA that some of us might have been engaged in way back when. Um, and we took a giant leap forward uh, in, a, in uh, moving towards a, a clean energy future with the greenhouse gas standards for the light duty vehicles, which, which the dean uh, referenced earlier. Those standards were welcomed by the car manufacturers. They were welcomed by the United Auto Workers. They were welcomed by consumer groups. Now you may say to yourself, it doesn't get any better than this. Well, it doesn't for me, but it doesn't mean that those actions weren't fraught with controversy. Um, and, they, and it doesn't mean that we don't have to continue to be diligent about how those rules are regulated to ensure they deliver the common sense solutions that we all thought they would. And I will tell you very frankly, so far so good. Uh, we are doing very well. What we thought we would do is what we have accomplished. And it's a, again a remarkable credit to the president's leadership. But I think the president knew that EPA, throughout its last four years under his tenure, had actually done what we were supposed to do. We followed the law, we saw where the science was leading, and we took advantage of every creative, flexible, cost-effective, common sense opportunity to drive solutions to the table. And we both knew that there was so much more that we could do over the next four years, and that we had to do to build on the success in the first term. In fact, the, the president even had the courage in the, in the vision uh, during this whole confirmation process to stand up in 100 plus degree weather and to melt at the podium uh, while at the uh, Georgetown University and give what I believe and what is clearly the most compelling and most important speech on climate change that any American president has ever delivered. And he called upon all of us to take action. Most notably, EPA was sort of front and center of those discussions, and frankly, that's exactly where we want to be, uh, because we can deliver on those promises. He told us to work with states, to work with local communities, to work with businesses, to work with the faith community, to work with NGOs, to work with environmental constituents, to work with individuals as we move forward. And he told us to reduce pollution from the power sector. He told us not just to tackle what new facilities ought to look like, but to actually challenge ourselves to work with all of those partners to deliver a power sector that currently exists that can drive greenhouse gases down. And that is exactly what we want to do. And he challenged it in a way that was very interesting because he wanted us to make sure that the effort to reduce greenhouse gases in the electricity sector through the power industry would actually continue to allow and encourage homegrown energy to be produced while we steadily and surely cut carbon pollution. That way, he knew, and I know, we can protect the health of our children. We can build a cleaner, more sustainable energy sector, and we can leave behind an environment that Maggie will be proud of. That's what the goal is here, folks. That's what we're all driving for. And we also need to make sure that as the climate is changing, and we know it is changing. 
that we have to ensure that our communities are resilient enough to adapt to a changing climate. That speech that he gave was all about how a president leads and how an environment is treated when you are a steward of that environment. So this is really quite a wicked, cool, exciting time for me. I also know that it, it's an exciting time for all of you because we've worked together for way too long for, us to think, for me to think that I am going this alone. And in fact, I am here to prove that I'm not because I'm dragging you all with me <laughs> just as you all dragged me with you for many years. Um, I also want to acknowledge one more individual, and that's Bob Perciseppi. Um, I don't know if everybody knows Bob, but if you don't, you should. Um, he is a wonderful colleague and a friend. Um, he filled in as acting administrator and filled his role as deputy administrator uh, while I was in confirmation limbo. Um, he helped to, to guide the agency through what we knew was a difficult transition period. I um, mean, he did it with his typical wit, his wisdom, and, and his grace. And I will tell you that I am so looking forward to having him as a partner over the next three and a half years. Um, he is just a good guy, and he's everything that you really want a public servant to be. So having said that, I also want to acknowledge in my straight shooting fashion that we have challenges ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have uh, challenges that range from substance to failures to communicate. Um, and we need, we need to fix those, right? You, you like that? What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Uh, but it is, it is a pivotal moment, and it's one we all need to step up for. It's time for a transition at EPA so that we can make sure that we're taking care of and addressing the challenges of today which are increasingly more complicated than they have ever been before. Now, many of you know, and I think the dean mentioned, that EPA was created way back 43 years ago by, uh, by executive order of President Richard Nixon. How cool is that? Who knew an executive order should be, could be so lasting? Maybe I shouldn't give anybody a clue that that may be a way. <laughs> Uh, the, and uh, I will tell you, during that time, this country's had some enormous successes on the environmental front. Um, you don't need to be quite as old as me to figure that out. Um, but if you are as old as me, you will remember driving through the city of, of Lowell and Lawrence, those cities where uh, uh, it wasn't so pretty to see the rivers running yellow one day, green the next, and blue the next depending upon what the textile industries were discharging into those rivers. Um, well, that might have been sort of pretty when you're a kid, but right now it's not what you want to see and it's not what you see. Uh, we have made some tremendous success. In fact, between 1970 and, and 2011, emissions of air pollutants dropped 68%, while the U.S. domestic product grew 212%. And the US population at the same time grew 52%. What you really want to grow grew. What you really want to go down went down. In fact, from 70 to 1990, programs under the Clean Air Act alone helped prevent more than 205,000 premature deaths, 843,000 asthma attacks, 18 million child respiratory illnesses. And while EPA states, tribes, and local communities were all accomplishing together these major health improvements, as the law intended and the science demanded, total private sector jobs increased by 88%. Can we stop talking about environmental regulations killing jobs, please? Just at least for today. According to our analysis, the Clean Air Act in 2020 will outweigh the costs by a ratio of more than 30 to 1. Benefits for every dollar, $30. Now that is not too shabby, but that's not where the story ends. 
If you look at today, if you look at Brownfields programs that began in 1995 and continue today, EPA has provided tools to communities and to tribes to assist them in making more than 41,500 acres ready for reuse. It helped create more than 93,000 jobs for cleanup and for those redevelopment activities. And it leveraged more than $20.8 billion in economic development. Now, based on historical data and, and what our grantees are telling us, that means that for every dollar that EPA Brownfields funding leverages between $17 and $18 in public and private funds are leveraged to advance cleanup and development of these properties. That is how you use federal dollars to advance the public interest. That is what EPA is all about. We are not just about rules and regulations. We're about getting environmental improvement wherever it makes sense to improve. And frankly, that still is everywhere. We still can do better because the more you look at the science, the more it drives you to improvements. And we're not going to stop looking at the science. And we're not going to stop driving towards improvements. But these successes, they represent real change in, in, in real communities across all of the country. They're concrete examples of how EPA is having a substantive, positive impact on the lives of everyday people all across the United States, and we're doing so in a way that, doesn't not, that not only doesn't slow the economy, but in many ways that sparks economic growth. But regardless of, of um, proven successes, as I've said, we're facing significant challenges, and we need to have our eyes open as we, as we face those. We have to be ready to not just tout our past successes, but we have to convince the American public that we're taking advantage of the best thinking, the newest technologies, the most cost-effective, sustainable solutions to meet their needs, as well as the mission of EPA moving forward. Now, that means understanding how climate change solutions and other environmental protections fit as part of a sound national and global environmental and economic agenda. We need to feed the economic agenda of this country. We have to move beyond all those old discussions about how there's no inherent conflict between environment and economy. How many times have we said that? We, we, we really need to recognize that the future, our future, my children's future, depends on an economy that moves beyond that dichotomy issue and that recognizes that, that the limitations of the, world re, of the world's resources are real, the fragility of the world's ecosystems are real, the threats posed by pollution and the changing climate are real, and that to turn those challenges around, we need a strong, sustainable economy that embraces these issues and behaves in accordance with, with what we know about science, the environment, technology, public health. We need the economy. We need the economy to serve the needs of current and future generations. That's where jobs will grow. That's how we have to look at the world moving forward. For too long, we've been focused on this false choice. It's not a choice between the health of our children and the health of the economy. We have endlessly debated that choice, even in the face of 43 years of documented history that should by now have put that issue to rest. Today, the truth is that we need to embrace cutting carbon pollution as a way to spark business innovation. And I said spark, S-P-A-R-K. We need to cut carbon pollution to grow jobs. We need to cut carbon pollution to strengthen the economy. Let's talk about this positively. Let's approach this as an opportunity of a lifetime. 
because there are too many lifetimes at stake to not embrace it this way, the way this country has always embraced its challenges, head on. That's how we need to deal with this issue. You know, I, I listened with a, a little bit of dismay, uh, but perhaps no real surprise, uh, following the, the President's Georgetown address, uh, that some of the, the folks were, were sort of criticizing him and, and belittling the speech as really some ancillary environmental issue. So I should say environmental issue, um, ra rather than focusing on the economy. Hello. <laughs> Climate change isn't an environmental issue. It is a fundamental economic challenge for us. It's a fundamental challenge internationally. Um, and we need to, again, embrace that challenge. I am quite sure that following Hurricane Sandy, nobody looked at that hurricane as an environmental challenge. They looked at it as an economic devastation. They looked at it as a storm that took lives and prevented other people from living their lives the way they had before. That's what Sandy was. New York knows it. New Jersey knows it. Connecticut knows it. God love poor Connecticut. Can they get hit again anytime soon? I hope not. Um, I love them dearly. And I think that New England is very clear that this is an economic challenge. And it's also very clear that it's an economic opportunity here. Now let's go back just one more time because we, this is worth dwelling on. Let's talk about those fuel economy standards again. Let's talk about the president in 2011, working with industry leaders, working with our government partners. The idea was to sp find smart, pragmatic solutions to reduce carbon pollution from passion to cars and trucks. But we need to do it, do it in a way that sparked our reinvestment and re reinvigorated our reinvestment in the American auto industry. Well, on the brink of collapse four years ago, the Center for Automotive Research now predicts the auto industry will add 35,000 jobs in 2013 alone. In the Wall Street Journal, the bastion of environmental work, <laughs> said the industry is emerging as an export powerhouse with more than one million cars and light, light trucks exported from the US auto plants. Interesting enough, the Wall Street Journal failed to credit EPA with being a partner in this effort. What's that all about? But anyways, uh, the light duty vehicle success followed a game plan that EPA really needs to bring to the work that we do. Um, it, it is a way of hoping that we can reinvigorate the same kind of ingenuity and creativity in every sector. We have started with the utility sector. The energy world is changing, and many in the energy world are embracing that change. And we really need to work with states and local communities. EPA cannot dictate solutions. We have to, we have to engage solutions through partnerships, through collaboration. And we also have to recognize that the federal government, most of all, doesn't lead. We follow. Who do we follow? All of you. We follow our local communities, our neighborhoods, our cities, our towns. We follow rural American urban areas. We follow states. We listen to what's done on the ground. And eventually, that is loud enough that people hear it in DC and they take action. You have been doing this for so long. Thank God for you folks. Thank God for the energy, for the enthusiasm. I know that states, local communities, industry, universities, nonprofits, you have been piloting projects in the New England area and beyond. You had been advancing smart policies, developing best practices. You've been following the same blueprint over and over, leveraging environmental and economic interests for your maximum benefit. In that scenario, climate change, reduced carbon, will always win. It will always win if you face it this way. But you guys know that. Just standing here, I'm just, I marvel at what Massachusetts has done. 
I congratulate them. I marvel at what cities of Boston has done. And I, I marvel at what Somerville has done. You go, everybody. I mean, it is amazing. Um, I can remember that when I was a kid, if you went to Boston Harbor, um, you had to make sure to bring something to wipe the oil off your body uh, after you went in the water. Um, I, I can remember doing that every time I went to the beach. Um, I think if you ask Mayor Menino now, uh, what is one of the greatest achievements that the city of Boston has ever managed to do? And that is to the clean up Boston Harbor. Right now, that effort has been so successful that I no longer can afford to live <laughs> or buy any waterfront property in the city of Boston. So I'm slightly resentful. Uh, but these, these on the ground efforts, that they are, they're, they're our future. Uh, they're the smart solutions. They'll help grow, hopefully, and be models for success across the United States. You know, as, and, and the way I figure it is as more businesses think about the opportunity of climate change and see additional pub public and private sector investments being leveraged to support infrastructure, to support clean energy, that those investments in turn will leverage more. And that this won't be about what government is doing, but what the whole economy is doing to provide a bright future for the United States of America. You know, last month when uh, the president unveiled his plan, he made a, a, an urgent effort, uh, he made an urgent case to take immediate efforts to tackle climate change. This is how he said it. The question now is whether we will have the courage to act before it's too late and how we answer will have a profound impact on the world that we leave behind. Other countries have recognized the potential in clean energy and they're making historic investments in those advancements. The president has done his best over the past four years to also dedicate significant resources to this effort. But it really is time for all of us to step up at every level of government in the pu public and private sectors and nonprofit community. We need industry as well as other businesses, small, big, startups, established companies. We need them working with community and with labor leaders. We need activists, scholars, and scientists, maybe even a lawyer or two. <laughs> and working together, we need to define a future that we all care about and can embrace. And I know as well as anyone that most of the efforts that have been successful to date to reduce carbon have come from my dear states. Nearly a dozen states have already implemented or are implementing their own market-based reduction programs. More than 25 have set energy efficiency targets. More than 35 have set renewable energy targets. And over 1,000 mayors across the country have signed agreements to cut pollution in their cities. These local and state officials are leading the charge. And we at EPA don't plan to do anything but follow their lead. We will support them and we will work with them as we face the challenges ahead. This is what you will see, if I can give you a hint, on the infamous 111B and 111D. We'll focus on innovation, we'll focus on a path forward, we'll focus on collaboration, we'll respect what states have done, and we will move forward together. We have no choice, that's what the president said, he's my boss, you're gonna have to live with it. <laughs> I just also wanted to recognize that thankfully I have the great work of Lisa P. Jackson uh, to actually build on. Um, she has been a terrific role model for me as well. And she's reminded me time and again that please don't forget her environmental justice communities. And I want to assure everybody here, and I was so happy to hear Dean Minow mention this, uh, because I am, have no intention of leaving behind the environmental justice communities. Uh, nationally, we have tremendous work to do. 
Uh, but community by community, we do have to recognize that there are communities that are bearing significant burdens of environmental and health challenges in their communities. We can't just rely on national rules to get the average up. We need to look at who is not winning in this equation. And we need to recognize that if you look at those same communities that today are challenged, those are exactly the same communities that in a changing climate will bear the brunt of a changing climate. We know that if you have the resources to pick up and move, from your coast, when, when, it, when, the, when the ocean is coming at you, you're going to be a whole lot better than those that don't have the wherewithal to be able to change. We need to recognize that and work with those communities. First, to deliver some of the toxic reductions that we need in those communities, and then work with them to ensure that they remain as resilient as we can get them working with our communities at the local level. We see, thank you. <laughs> we see all of the projections for, for numerous extreme weather events. Um, we know that, that we're going to have a challenge moving forward. I think one of the biggest uh, adjustments that EPA is going to make is to try to figure out how we can invigorate ourselves and our communities to face the water challenges that are here already and that will only get worse if we don't fix them or at least address them. We all knew that water is a limited precious resource. We all knew that in a changing climate with droughts over here and floods over here, sometimes in the same state, you're going to end up with water challenges. We already knew, oh God, five years ago, I can remember uh, a uh, wastewater treatment facility in Maine that was underwater for two weeks. It worked brilliantly. Never had any backups. <laughs> Just didn't go anywhere, right? Uh, and, and with the changing climate, we, have, we are inundating our stormwater structures. We are burying our water treatment facilities. We are at risk of losing our ability to deliver clean drinking water. We need to address that. We need to understand not just what a changing climate means, but what our current challenges are. And we need to face those together. And those are some of the most difficult challenges we are going to face in a capital-constrained world, right? We need to bring new ideas to the table, new ways of planning together, new ways of bringing capital to the table, new ways of working at green infrastructure. So we can't all be about climate as if the only thing we have to do is to figure out how to deal with the energy world. We have to deal with our fundamental protections that have delivered all of those benefits that I talked about earlier. And we need to make sure that we don't go backwards, but we can continue to move forward. Now, in closing, I, ha I have uh, you know, little doubt, frankly, about the continued critical importance of my agency. Um, and it is my agency. Um, <laughs> and I have little doubt that the people at EPA will manage me effectively. <laughs> They have been doing that for four years. And despite my best efforts, we are succeeding. Um, I have little doubt um, that the president knew the challenge that he was handing to me and to others in the administration, and that, would, that he was embracing himself. To stop relying on a Congress to act on an issue that is too important to wait. We will act. We will be smart. We will be come back and haunt all of you who have been doing it for so long. And we will rely on your support as we integrate our environmental challenges into a sustainable economy. Thank you very much. People just felt obligated to stand at the end because you stood at the beginning. Well, the administrator has graciously agreed to take some questions. That doesn't mean she's agreed to answer them, but she's agreed to take uh, some questions. So I've got a few here uh, from the audience. Uh, here's the first one. 
Uh, the Boston-based organization Ceres yesterday issued a report that flared gas in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota doubled in the past two years with a loss of fuel valued at $1 billion. The capture of this gas is achievable with available technology. What will you do as administrator to address this problem beyond the 2012 new source performance standards, which the questioner says were only modest in its reach? Uh, I like that question up until the end. <laughs> uh, no. Um, actually, I'm pretty familiar with the work in the Bakken, and, and uh, it is work that, that is going on and that needs to be looked at across the, across the U.S. and particularly in the West. I remember seeing a satellite photo, have, has any, anybody seen it, of all the lights now uh, because of the, the flaring that is, that is going on. Um, I will tell you, I had no idea, being from New England, that there was so much stuff going on I knew nothing about. I know it now. Um, I know it now. One of the things the president actually dictated that we do in his uh, speech in, in, the in the climate action plan that he unveiled uh, was to sit down with me and with Ernie Moniz, who's also, yeah, Brookline, uh, <laughs> with Ernie Moniz and uh, with, with Sally, uh, you know, at, at DOI, um, and to really figure out how, how we w would work together. Um, and, and address methane as an issue. Uh, we know that methane pre prevents, presents incredible opportunities for us. I will tell you that I think we did pretty well with the 2012. What, what we did with the new source performance standard in 2012 is we identified a, re a way to regulate emissions from fracking that would begin with with uh, the, the gas wells, because we had the data for that, and it would require flaring right away. But as quick a period as innovation and technology would allow, that's going to be transferred into a recapture opportunity. So that all those resources that are now going up in the air are going to be captured and, and resold, making that one of the few rules at EPA that is on its face saving a ton of money. Never mind looking at long range or other benefits, on its face it's saving money. We need to do the same thing looking at oil and looking at combined. We just didn't have the data. But thankfully we have partnerships in the utility world who are working with this and in the NGO community who are going to provide us the information we need to do what we did in, in the gas world and bring really smart solutions to the table. I have every confidence we can do that. Here's the next question. Um, what can the EPA and others do to develop educational and communication strategies to overcome the stalemates in environmental efforts? Can we point to China and other regimes suffering visibly due to failures to protect the environment or mix fear and hope in new ways. Was that a dichotomy? Is it, <laughs> is it, is it either or choice? Um, you know, I have, I honestly have mixed emotions about the, the pictures of China and telling everybody that that's going to be what the U.S. looks like. Um, I, I don't believe that. I, I think we've already gone past that, and I do think that there are challenges that we need to face that continue to move us forward. I would also tell you that I have established some great relationships with folks in China that are working on these issues, and my heart breaks um, when I see the challenges that they're facing. Um, but I, I do think that it's now an exceedingly small world. Um, I think we now have, uh, sec, 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 I always say Senator, but I mean Secretary Kerry, blah, 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 um, who is on the team now. Um, and I know his, his first week on the job in mine uh, was to sit down with folks from China and the US and to try to figure out how we share the information we have, how we make it an opportunity to grow uh, technology innovation and, and to bring it elsewhere. Um, I think China recognizes that they're facing a social issue of huge proportions, which means they're paying attention. But nothing turns on a dime, no matter how much you want it to. And so whatever collaborations we need to make that recognizes the challenges and, and works to actively minimize the time to address those is what we're looking for. But everyone knows that our environmental challenges, you know, our, our successes took 43 years to, to do. You cannot expect a, a growing, developing nation to be 
today what took us 43 years to achieve. So we need to work together and we need to recognize on issues like climate that we are running a marathon, not a sprint. Out of the gate, you need to make sure that you're running steady, that you have lots of people with you, and then in the end, run like heck so you can take it, get that finish line first, right? Um, a more practical question. Now that Congress is proposing to cut your budget by one third, how will you do your job? How about that? <laughs> Success already. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, as I, as I tell the, the great people at EPA, that, that's the House budget. Um, it also had you know, dozens of riders that do everything but say EPA can't do anything. Um, and we, we know it's a challenge. We, wor we work through these issues. We work through every one of those riders. Um, there is no question, and I don't think I've tried to deny it, that e EPA is facing some significant challenges. You know, I think in many ways it, it's uh, uh, being blamed for, for lots of challenges that if we had our druthers, we wouldn't be blamed for. Uh, but frankly, we have to not be woe is me and stand up and be proud of the work we do. We have to talk about it. We have to, again, enhance collaborations, build partnerships. Uh, teams are stronger than any one individual. Um, that's why I need all of you to stand up with EPA, to stand up for what we know to be the path forward, to stand up for Maggie, Julie, and Daniel's future. Um, if we do that together, we'll get over the hump of uh, proposed 33% reduction, and we'll start looking at, at the future as a place where we can all be very proud. Here's a, a question from an environmental justice perspective. Uh, how will EPA be able to help American Indian tribes that are adversely affected by the closure of coal burning power plants in the West? Uh, one example the questioner cites is the proposal to shut down one unit of the Navajo generating station in Arizona. Yeah. I, I actually think the Navajo generating station is a, um, it, 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 it was an issue that I was faced with and this is an issue that has to do with regional haze. I will readily admit to you that regional haze is not my favorite issue. Um, I really like those public health things that you can go, how many lives, and da, da, da. Regional haze is not that issue, um, and it's very challenging, and the agency has taken so long to address these issues that we're under some incredibly aggressive timelines to address them. Having said that, um, I, I went to the Navajo Generating Station. It was really cool, actually. The whole area was really cool. The generating station, not so much. One power facility looks like another, only it's humongo. It's, it's very large. Um, and we spent time with the Navajo. We spent time with the Hopi. We spent time with the Gila River uh, folks. We spent time with, with the state. Uh, we spent time with all of the folks that have worked so hard to bring water rights to those, to those tribes, and there was no way that we wanted our interest and our obligation to address regional haze to stand in the way of those Indian tribes getting what, what they justly deserve to get, and to get it in a way that allowed them to keep their economies moving forward. So we worked with the Salt River Project that operates the Navajo Generating Station. Uh, we put in a, a, a proposal on the table that if you saw where we started, it would have knocked your socks off uh, because it was an outline of a number of different opportunities for the tribes to think about. It was an open invitation for them to come back and to tell us what they wanted to do. And indeed, the, last week, we received a proposal from the, tri from the tribes, from the owners of that utility, that, would, that was to them the path forward for them. I am proud of the work that we did to get this far. And I know that they have a lot of partners that agree with them that it's the best solution. Many of those partners are folks that I trust and respect. And I'm sure that we can use this in a, as an example of how to deal with our, our public in a way that serves their interests and meets our legal obligations. And I'm really excited about this one. DOI's been great too, by the way. Uh, they've been wonderful to work with. Uh, here's a question, uh, clearly comes from someone with the Sierra Club. It's a statement followed by a question. The, the statement, 
is the Sierra Club congratulates you on your confirmation, looks forward to your continued achievements. And then, of course, there's the question. Uh, regarding the proposed Keystone XL pipeline, uh, can you envision any it's way... It's been very nice to talk to you all. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, it's a pipeline out in the Pacific. Okay. Um, any way that 800,000 barrels a day of high carbon tar sands could not be a significant impact uh, on further on climate change? Um, in, in all seriousness, I think the administration is really carefully looking at, with the State Department as a lead um, at the environmental impacts associated with the Keystone Pipeline. I know it's an issue, and I think you heard the president speak to this issue. Um, I think the best that the EPA can do is to, is to continue to be an honest uh, commenter on the environmental impact statement, we've, which we've done our best to do. Um, and we'll continue to do that and work with the administration as difficult decisions are made. You know, e EPA it, it does not have all the answers, in, in case you haven't quite figured that out lately. Um, I knew when I worked for a state that I disagreed with some of the answers they were coming up with, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to have those disagreements and those, those dialogues. But I will honestly tell you that that's how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be easy. You know, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be all different interests coming together and screaming at the top of their voices like three crazy children that I've brought up. Um, and I don't, so I don't think it's my job out of the gate to know what the path forward is. It is absolutely my obligation to allow those voices to be heard and to listen to them. Um, and it's my obligation to keep peace in the family, whether it's my little one or the EPA one, and we'll do that together. Thank you very much. Time for one more, one last question. Uh, given virtually uh, the significant opposition in Congress, uh, many of which deny the science of climate change, uh, what steps do you see as key to surmounting that opposition and building the public will necessary for EPA and the administration to promulgate and defend the carbon regulations now necessary? Okay. That's a terrific question. That's a terrific question, I think, to end on. Um, I will tell you that I know you're all probably going to be surprised, but I'm a child of the 60s. I know I totally don't look that old. <laughs> in fact, I'm so glad there was a four-year-old picture up there because I've aged considerably in four years. Um, I, I, I believe in movements, not actions. <laughs> I believe in campaigns. You know, I, I believe in grassroots organizing. I see some of my friends that have worked with me hand in hand to make sure that people are educated, that they understand the challenges that we're facing, that they embrace them, that they not run away from them. I know that I've worked with many of you who have taught me those lessons about how you don't sit in a, a room by yourself and think big thoughts because they, it just won't work. It, it is about expanding the conversation. It is about getting everybody to think collaboratively and work together. Um, it, it is about launching a campaign where we're honest about the challenges and we're open to every solution offered to us. Um, it's about EPA continuing to work for the president and with the states, local communities, businesses, our advocates, the labor community, the faith community, listen to everybody who has a stake in these issues. Climate change will not be resolved overnight, but it will be engaged over the next three years. That I can promise you. Administrator McCarthy, uh, we're honored by your presence here. And we're grateful for you, for your service on behalf of the nation and its environment. As you say, the challenges at EPA that you face are great, but so too are the environmental laws of the nation that you are now responsible for administering. 
So there's much to do and much that you can do. I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. Let's thank once again Administrator McCarthy for joining us and welcome you here back home in Massachusetts, Boston. <laughs>